Welcome to the Supply Chain Insights webinar, Understanding the Supply Chain Index. I'm your host, Allison Crawford. Companies want to improve their supply chain, but not all succeed. In our Supply Chains to Admire work, we've identified the supply chains that are outperforming their peers in verticals such as chemical, consumer products, and food and beverage. In this research, we took a look at inventory turns, return on investment, and profitability, along with other metrics to see who is making the most change. Today, Laura will discuss the industry trends that are impacting progress, which companies are driving the fastest improvements, and why. Before I hand this over to Laura to go through the deck, there are a few things I want to cover with you. We're recording today's session, and we'll post it to our on-demand webinar page. You can visit our website to listen to this or any of the other webinars. Additionally, we'll send out the slides to all attendees within 24 hours of the conclusion of the presentation. We encourage you to share these slides with others in your organization, and if you have questions, reach out to Laura or myself to set up a discussion. We also want to hear your questions about our findings. Please post to the Q&A or chat function to the left of your screen. We've left time at the end of the webinar to address all of your questions. Finally, we'll be live tweeting the webinar. So if you'd like to join in the social media conversation, you can use the hashtag SCEIWebinar and at SC Insights LLC during the event. Now, let me introduce Laura Ciceri, founder of Supply Chain Insights, prolific author and blogger, supply chain thought leader with deep experience in industry as well as research. Now, Laura, I know we have quite a few slides to go through today, so without further ado, let me hand this over to you. Laura? Thank you, Allison. Mute buttons work really well on the PC. Can you hear me now? Laura, are you on mute? Allison, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure what happened, but I appreciate folks joining us this morning. I want to talk today about the journey of supply chain excellence and what we've learned in the research that we've been doing on looking at what drives supply chain performance and what drives supply chain excellence. So I manage a small company named Supply Chain Insights, and I write openly on a blog called The Supply Chain Shaman. I also share all the research that you're going to see on SlideShare, and in fact, one of the questions I often get is, can people get access to these slides? And we will post both the webinar and the slides to SlideShare to allow everyone to get the data. So our goal is to help the average Joe. You know, many times when I was in supply chain operations, we'd sit in a conference room and we'd talk about driving supply chain excellence. And I get to review probably 50 supply chain strategy decks a year. and each of the strategy decks will have a statement about driving supply chain excellence. And when I ask companies to define supply chain excellence for me, I get a dull silence, like, aren't you the dumbest analyst in the world that you don't know what supply chain excellence is? But if we think about supply chain, it's about 30 years old. And we have had a lot of projects, and the projects have had a lot of success, but as we think about organizations and we think about the tie of the supply chain to the balance sheet, I want to help you with some insights about what's possible, where companies have been, and how to think about supply chain excellence. Now, my journey in this has really been in my writing. In 2012, I wanted to write on the 30th anniversary of supply chain management a celebratory book, and I was under contract with Wiley to write the book, Bricks Matter. And I had worked with about 300 organizations and analyst roles at Gartner and AMR Research, and I wanted to tell their story. I wanted to tell how I had watched them save money, improve inventory, and dramatically improve competitive advantage. But what I did was I printed all of the financial balance sheets of the companies that I had worked with, and I found that most companies weren't making progress or some companies were going backwards. 
And I really was not in connection with this as an analyst. I had worked more with projects on a project implementation level, not really looking at the connection of supply chain to financial results. So I was under contract, and so I finished the book, Bricks Matter, and that book is really more of a historic perspective around supply chain processes. But in the book, Metrics That Matter, I took it one step further, and I started looking at a decade of financial data by industry and really started mining the patterns for what could we see. And it's been a journey for me. In fact, it's been a three-year journey, and a lot of work has gone into it from the team that works with me. And we also share a lot of the data on the Shaman's Journals, which are the soft copy books, which have the insights from the journey that I've been on to understand these metrics in these soft copy books, which are available on Amazon. And you know, let us know if you can't find them. So let's think about the goal. So when I worked at technology companies, we would go in and we would talk to a manufacturing company or a retailer or a distributor about the goal of supply chain planning. And the goal was typically at the intersection of operating margin, inventory turns, and customer service. But for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to use a two-dimension graph. And I thought we were moving up the chart of the intersection of inventory turns and operating margin. What I found was that most companies weren't. They weren't moving against this best scenario. And I struggled for why. And in fact, I looked at all the companies I worked with and I found that only one-tenth were actually moving up this chart. And so I wanted to better understand why, and that was the genesis of the work on the supply chain index. And through this work, I really started to think about a sentence I had heard at a conference about the supply chain being a complex system with complex processes and increasing complexity. And as an analyst, I had done more writing on the fact that it was a complex process with increased complexity but I hadn't really thought enough, in my opinion, about the relationship of the metrics as a complex system. And in a complex system, what you have is you have a relationship between the metrics that really forms a frontier or forms an optimal state that you've got to balance. And so as you work with the metrics, they're interrelated, and it's easy to throw a system out of balance. And so as processes have become more complex and as complexity has become more complex, either through the growth of the global organization or through increasing customer strategies or customer complexity or regulation in certain industries like pharmaceuticals or increasing item master where we've seen 37% increase in food and beverage, the supply chain has become more complex, but underneath it is a complex system. So when we talk about the relationship between inventory and operating margin, every organization has its own potential in this complex system. And so as we think about the metrics, we can't think about them in isolation. We have to think about them as a complex system. And this work caused me to really start to think about what data could I get to that could represent this complex system? So I built a model called the supply chain effective frontier, and it's deliberately not called the efficient frontier because in supply chain we often think about efficiency as the lowest cost per unit, and I don't necessarily think that the efficient supply chain is always the most effective. And in fact, I think sometimes we need to have a very responsive supply chain that doesn't have the lowest cost per unit. But as we design supply chain strategies, I think we've got to think about how do we balance these elements? How do we balance year-over-year -year growth, which can cause a tension or a pull on inventory, which is part of the cycle? And how do we balance growth with profitability? And how do we balance profitability and complexity? And so as we go through this, 
what I wanted to do was to not just understand the metrics in isolation, but to understand the inner relationship of the metrics as they tie to the complex system. And in our research, we also do a lot of quantitative work. One of the things I found in parallel to me doing this work was that when we studied companies, and this came from a number of studies that we did when we aggregated the population, we found that roughly one in three companies felt that they were traditional and tactful and cautious and that there was a lot of room for improvement. And they wanted to be more agile. They wanted to be more aligned. They wanted to be more proactive. But they were struggling with, you know, how to do this. And so, you know, my belief is that 9 out of 10 supply chains are stuck, sort of like gum on the bottom of your shoe on a hot afternoon or a car that's stuck in the mud that we just keep revving the engines trying to move things in the same old-fashioned way and we're not making progress. So the index was built to say which supply chains are making progress. And selfishly, what we wanted for our research was an objective method so we could look at what things were people doing that caused them to not be like this car stuck in the mud or not be like this gum on the bottom of the shoe that was stuck. But what things were people doing that was moving their operation ahead. And so this concept of supply chain excellence that we've been thinking a lot for the past three years that we've done our writing and we've done our research, we've formed some definitions. And to have the discussion today, what I want to do is I want to start with some definitions. The first is the metrics that matter. I define the metrics that matter as the metrics that improve market capitalization. So in our work, one of the first things that we did was we did a test for which metrics actually tied to market capitalization. And we took 15 years of research on metrics and we threw them all in a pot and we looked at ratios because the ratios allowed us to compare big companies to small companies and allowed us to actually measure across uh, zones and currencies, and we looked at which metrics actually correlated to market cap, market cap being the number of shares outstanding by the price. And yes, we've got a lot of variation year to year in price, but what I found interesting in this chart was the role of inventory across almost every industry and the fact that we're not making a lot of progress on inventory. We've done a lot of talking about inventory, but most of the work that we've done on improving cash to cash has been with payables. The other thing that I found very interesting on this chart was that return on assets actually has a much lower correlation to market capitalization than return on invested capital, which many supply chain leaders don't know the definition of return on invested capital, but it's the ability to take all assets, including inventory, and look at are you returning to the corporation at a rate that's higher than the rate of capital in the open market? And so what I did was I sat back and I tried to come up with a way that I could look across all of the metrics that mattered to come up with a way to measure supply chain performance. So the first thing I did was I measured which metrics matter. And in our work, what we want to do is we want to help companies to become more market-driven, to become more agile, to sense and respond market to market, and to be able to drive improvement year over year, irrespective of economic conditions. So for that reason, we wanted a methodology that would allow us to look year over year. The second thing was I believe strongly that every industry has a different rhythm and cycle and that you can't put all companies in a spreadsheet and shake them up, that you've really got to compare the packaging industry to the packaging industry and consumer packaged goods to consumer packaged goods and chemical to chemical and automotive to automotive. So we broke the industries into NAX codes. And it's not a perfect system because we could argue that a conglomerate like J&J &J can actually fit in multiple NAX codes. Or we could argue that you know, certain companies fit in between NAX codes. 
but it's better than putting all of the companies in a spreadsheet and shaking them up. So we wanted to build a method to measure improvement. And so the definition of excellence that we're using is that a company is able to drive both improvement and also to have performance better than the peer group. And if they have improvement and they have performance better than the peer group, then we group them into the category of the supply chains to admire. And this is an annual study that we do across all supply chains and all industries and all company sizes as an objective and independent analysis to determine which supply chains are outperforming on the supply chain metrics that matter. And we use the effective frontier model as the representation of the balanced set of measurements for the supply chain. So if we go back to the effective frontier, what we're doing on the supply chain index is we're looking at the intersection between growth and return on invested capital, and return on invested capital is used for complexity, and the intersection of profitability and inventory turns. And so this base model forms the underlying paradigm that we're judging both the supply chains to admire and the supply chain index. So in our research and our writing, we use these definitions to really start to look at what are the trends in supply chain. Now I've been an analyst for about 13 years. First worked at Gartner, then I worked at AMR, and then I did a short stint at Altimeter Group, and then I founded Supply Chain Insights three and a half years ago. And in this process, you know, the more I write about supply chain excellence, the more that I want to know because it's such a deep topic. And so you know, in 2006, I was working on the, what's now the Gartner Top 25, which was at that point in time the AMR Top 25, and it was our first foray at AMR research to be able to look at which companies were performing the best. And at that point in time, we came up with a methodology that really looked at the top companies, so the Fortune 1000, and it was a combination of return on assets, inventory turns, and also growth, and it was about 50% opinion. And the Gartner Top 25 is in its 10th year. Now, the more I work on this, the more I question the methodology because I think you know, the opinion became much more of a beauty contest as I was an analyst and as I saw more and more companies come in with their corporate PR groups, it became much more about beauty versus supply chain excellence. The second thing is I think that this analysis is not long enough, and I'm going to show you some charts. I think that supply chain performance happens in a longer period of time, three to five years, and so this is not, I think, a long enough snapshot. Third is that it puts all companies in a spreadsheet and compares a company like Apple to a company like DuPont, Apple which has shed assets, DuPont which is very asset intensive, so I wanted to have a methodology that could be very industry specific. The other thing I question return on assets based upon the work that we've done on market capitalization. And so the research and the work we've done really goes back to the effective frontier and the metrics that matter to build a methodology to look at how are companies doing by industry irrespective of their size. And are they driving performance better than the peer group on the metrics that matter? And are they driving improvement that's better than the peer group for the metrics that matter? And we've looked at a couple of periods, and the data I'm going to show you is actually going to look at 2006 to 2014 and 2009 to 2014. So 2006 includes the recession because if you remember, I'm still testing against them market-driven concept that I want companies to be able to adapt as market conditions. But in the work that we're doing right now, we're actually driving the supply chains to admire analysis, the final cut on the 2009 to 2014 data. This is our second year of doing this research. And what you can expect from us in our countdown for the Global Summit, next week we'll publish on the automotive industry, the following week, we'll publish on the consumer electronics industry. We've already published on 
food and beverage, consumer packaged goods, pharmaceuticals, and chemicals. And we'll also have a final report on the day our summit opens where we will take snapshots of 20 industries which are outlined below. And while we won't have individual reports on this, we will show you the performance and the improvement of companies within these industries and the general trends. The 1st of October, based upon the work we've been doing with Arizona State, we'll actually share the correlations of the metrics that matter and the equations of the metrics that matter that tie to market capitalization. So that's what you can see from us and the report that you'll see on September 8th that will be on SlideShare will actually be a very big report and will take into consideration all of the 20 industries that I list below. So we're quite busy. The work is based upon publicly available data. So we're using uh, the data from balance sheets and income statements, and we're looking also at what can we find out by the industries. While some people might say, well, Laura, you're not factoring in customer service, and I would love to factor in customer service, the problem is I can't find an industry standard source of data to have customer service be in the effective frontier. So with that, let's start on what is the index. Let's start with the industries. I talked about each industry has its own rhythms and cycles, and this is a snapshot of industries for the period of 2006 to 2013. And what I want you to see from this are really five different trends. The first trend is each industry performs very differently. I liken this to athletes. Uh, every athlete performs very differently. They have a different potential. And so when we compare companies, I feel strongly we should compare companies within an industry. The second thing is you can see that we have greatly reduced cash to cash. And many people will give themselves a pat on the back because cash to cash, we want to be low. And all of the industries have improved cash to cash with the exception of consumer packaged goods and food and beverage. However, the way that we've improved cash to cash has been to elongate payables. We've pushed payables and we have extended the terms to suppliers. So in essence, we're squeezing the suppliers, pushing cost and waste back in the supply chain. But when we look at inventory and we look at the progress in inventory, the progress has been much slower than many people believe because we've been looking at the numbers that we've seen off of projects. And we want inventory turns to be fast. We want to turn inventory quickly. So you can see that inventory turns in the beverage industry have gone down. Inventory turns in the pharmaceutical industry have gone down. Inventory turns in the medical device industry have gone down. And in consumer packaged goods, they've gone down. So, you know, we want to turn inventory fast. So the better the number, the bigger the number, the better. So while when I sat at the kitchen table to write Bricks Matter, I thought we had made great improvement in inventory, we really haven't. And you know, it, we are inching along in inventory, and it's an important discussion because inventory is the buffer of the supply chain, and really managing inventory is so important. The other thing is, you know, revenue per employee. We've really focused on productivity of revenue per employee, and we've improved productivity substantially across the industries. You can see some industries have done better than others. However, the degree of that being absorbed into operating margin, you can see that we've improved revenue per employee much more than we've improved operating margin. And again, we want to have a large margin. And so you can see that some industries like grocery retail or retail apparel have actually seen a decline in margin. The other thing is year-over-year -year growth is slowing in the last three years. And you know, when growth is high, then supply chain doesn't matter as much. You know? But now that growth is slowing, the measurement of these and the management of these across this portfolio becomes more and more important. And then if we look at SG&A ratio, 
it's very important for us to be aligned in the supply chain to be able to drive the metrics that matter. So again, how did we get started? We first correlated the metrics to market capitalization. We built a model called the Effective Frontier. And we tried to say, how have industries done at the intersection, and how have companies done, and how have they done year over year, because we wanted to really look at market-driven. So when we did this, we built orbit charts. And the orbit charts allow us to track the trends over a period of time. So for example, this is Walmart. And Walmart has done the best in the mass merchandise retail industry. And you can see that Walmart primarily has improved inventory. If you trace the line from 2000, 2001 to 2002, you can see that they have zigzagged back and forth on operating margin, but they've primarily improved inventory turns. And the way to look at the orbit charts, which represent the year-over-year -year improvement at two intersections, inventory turns, and operating margins, is to really look at the averages which we have in the box. So what we did was we plotted hundreds of these charts, right, to be able to look at which companies did the best. And I actually took a pile of these charts to Dr. Runger at Arizona State University and said, you know, what defines supply chain excellence? I want to be in this best scenario over here on the right with the red print. But when we look at the patterns of companies, how do we determine who's done it the best? So here's an example of Apple. Apple, as you can see, is primarily made improvement in operating margins. So again, we have a case where we've got two measurements, inventory turns and operating margin. Walmart primarily made improvement in inventory. Apple is primarily made improvement in operating margin after, of course, they reduce the inventory. And then we had a third case of companies where Basically, they were at the same starting point in 2013 that they were in 2000. This is Dow Chemical Company. It's not that different than we see in a lot of chemical companies. DuPont has a similar pattern where companies have basically regressed on both metrics and had pretty wild gyrations and are about the same point in place. So three different cases. One, a company has made improvement in one of the two measurements, but not both. Two, the company hasn't made improvement at all. And I was really looking for the companies that had made improvement in both. And that was the journey I was on. So I took this stack of orbit charts to Dr. Runger at Arizona State University, and I said, help me to determine a methodology that will allow me to take the metrics that matter, which are the metrics that tie to market capitalization, and the orbit charts at the intersection of the metrics and build an index that will really represent supply chain improvement. So we worked about a year with all of the charts that we had done for all the industries. And we came up with a way to do this. And at the time, I was running a triathlon in training, and I thought it would be a lot like how we rank triathlons. So the first thing we did was we did an orbit chart at the intersection of return on invested capital and revenue growth, which if you remember, the effective frontier, we're using return on invested capital as a measure of complexity, and growth really looking at year-over-year -year growth. And what we wanted to see was what is the pattern of this particular chart. So let me show you a pattern for growth versus return on invested capital. This is Procter & Gamble. You can see that Procter & Gamble was making great progress at this intersection until the acquisition of Gillette in 2005. In the acquisition of Gillette, they went backwards and they lost control of the supply chain and this was their pattern at the intersection of return on invested capital and growth. So to measure the first factor in the index, we look at what is the intersection of return on invested capital and growth. The second we look at is the strength, which is the intersection of inventory turns and operating margin. And in both these cases, we look at a vector trajectory about how much progress our company is making so we look at the 
points and we look at, you know, how much of the distance of each of these points is actually driving us towards the ideal or the best scenario. And then the third factor we look at is the resiliency. How tight is the pattern? Because what we see in companies that are really performing well is they're driving balance, they're driving improvement at the intersection of return on invested capital and growth, managing assets and driving growth. They're also managing, because this is a complex system, inventory turns and operating margin, moving towards that best scenario. But the pattern is really tight, and I'll show you some examples of a very tight pattern. So for example, let's look at the pharmaceutical industry. One of my favorite charts is Eli Lilly versus Nova Nordisk. In the case of the pharmaceutical industry, it's a very tough industry with a lot of regulatory control. Now, when I was at AMR, I followed Eli Lilly very closely. I have a lot of respect for the folks at Lilly. They've done some great work around serialization, building uh, the global supply chain for diabetes. But, you know, they ran into some patent cliff problems. The supply chain really didn't readjust. And you can see that the supply chain actually started to decline on these two key metrics of inventory turns versus operating margin. Now let's take one of their close competitors in the same industry, which is Nova Nordisk, and let's look at the pattern of Nova Nordisk over time. You can see that Nova Nordisk is actually outperforming Eli Lilly in operating margin, but underperforming on average in inventory turns. But what's important is the pattern. So improvement is judged by this pattern. Are companies making an improvement at the pattern of both growth and return on invested capital and inventory turns and operating margin? And you can see here Nova Nordisk is making improvement where Eli Lilly is going backwards. So the foundation of the supply chain index is to look at what is the pattern. Are companies making improvement? And then to build the supply chains to admire work, what we wanted to do was to look at which companies had above average performance and were also driving improvement. So in the first work that we did, and it took us about seven months to do the first round of improvement, I got really excited, but then when I compared the improvement to performance, I found out that it was a lot like the TV show, The Biggest Loser. The company that has the most to improve will often make the fastest rate of improvement on the supply chain index, which makes sense when you think about it. It's a lot easier to drive improvement when you've got a lot to improve than when you've built that organizational muscle and you're really fine-tuning the supply chain. What's key is balancing performance, so the ability to be an above-average performer on the metrics that matter and drive improvement. So. What we did was we started looking at each of the industries, and let me show you an example of consumer packaged goods. So this is, again, taking all of the companies in the industry for consumer packaged goods, and notice I haven't included food, I've not included beverage, I've not included beauty, because those supply chains really have a very different rhythm and cycle and pattern, and it's not really a good comparison to cross industry subgroups. So what I was looking at is which companies had a better performance. So you can see at the bottom are the averages for this particular peer group. And then what we did was we said, how many of the companies were performing better than the average on operating margin, inventory turns, or return on invested capital? And we took three time horizons because we're researchers and we don't know the answer, so we're tr always trying to figure it out. So we took 2006 to 2014, which included the recession, 2009 to 2014, which is post-recession, 2011 to 2014, which is the most recent period, and we wanted to see how are things changing over that period of time and we also wanted to see who was improving over that period of time. So let's look at performance first. So you can see that Church and Dwight has 
above average performance and operating margin and inventory turns, but not on return on invested capital. This is also the case with Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble is not able to push return on invested capital to the level of the peer group. Now, Colgate Palmolive outperforms the peer group on return on invested capital, and you can see across all the measurements, they're actually a top performer. In fact, they're such a top performer, it's very hard for them to push the supply chain index, which the supply chain index, again, is a measurement of improvement. Rick at Ben Kaiser also is a top performer across all of those metrics. And again, it's very hard for Rick at Ben Kaiser to push levels of improvement. Kimberly Clark is underperforming on these measurements. And you can see for the longer period, they actually are doing the worst in the peer group, although they've made some recent improvement. And Unilever has had, you know, improvement, but they are not at peer group and operating margin. But you can see that the index, the lower the number in the index, the more improvement companies are making. So the study of the supply chains to admire looks at both performance and improvement in each of the industries. So we'll take 20 industries. And last year, when we looked at across the industries, this is the pattern that we saw. Let's just step back and say, what do we see in this data? First of all, there are met no medical device companies. So there was not a medical device company that had both the ability to perform better than the peer group and drive improvement. There's no pharmaceutical company. There's no retailer. And so that's very characteristic of supply chain performance in that particular industry. The other thing you can see is there are more high-tech companies, industrial value chain companies actually did quite well, despite the fact that we've had more demand and supply volatility in these industries than we've had in the process industries. And so there's a lot to learn there from these leaders about things like form and function of inventory and network design and building supply chain talent and the use of advanced analytics to really drive improvement because it matters. So what we're doing in the 2015 work is we're going into each of the industries. We're looking at performance and improvement, and we're looking at what are the patterns that we see. This work will actually culminate in our next book, which will be called Leadership That Matters, where we'll take the companies that are outperforming and we'll interview them to be able to see what's driving the top performance. So let's go back to consumer packaged goods. So we talked about the level of performance and we talked about improvement. Let's look at some of the orbit charts of companies in this peer group. Let's start with Unilever. <clears throat> so Unilever is a company that's made impressive gains. If you remember, they are underperforming on operating margin. But you can see the period of 2004 to 2006 was a time of marked change for Unilever. This is when they started their demand-driven initiatives. And in about 2008, they created a chief supply chain officer. And you can see that you know, they've worked to improve over the period of 2008 to 2014, but it hasn't been as linear of improvement as they had in 2004 to 2006 when they were really driving a lot of the demand-driven initiatives. Let's contrast this with Kimberly Clark. Kimberly Clark is the biggest loser in this particular category. Kimberly Clark has gone backwards on both of the metrics and is actually underperforming the category. And you can see in the orbit charts the pattern. Uh, they did a lot of business process outsourcing. They moved their headquarters. They had a strong focus on lean. It was very hard for Kimberly Clark to tie, make, source, and deliver together. And so it's an example of a company going backwards. These are very different patterns. But to understand performance and improvement, you first have got to graph the individual company. Then you've got to compare the company to its peer group. So let's take Procter & Gamble versus Unilever. 
So if we take the pattern and we look at Unilever versus Procter & Gamble, remember when I talked about in 2005, Procter & Gamble acquired Gillette, you can see that there was a fall off here in the pattern. The supply chain was thrown out of balance and it went backwards for Procter & Gamble on operating margin. This is also during the period of time that about 37% of new items were added in the item master and the company started building the global supply chain. Now in the last three years, there's been improvement in both operating margin and inventory turns, but not in return on invested capital. So the supply chain index, Procter & Gamble's come up slightly, but not really to the level of top performance or even mid-level performance. Let's look at Unilever. You can see the progress for Unilever and Unilever's averages are under Procter & Gamble. But to really understand the industry, you've got to do a number of comparisons. So this is Colgate versus Unilever. Colgate is the top performer along with Reckitt Van Kaiser. You can see that Colgate for the last three years has been struggling in both operating margin and inventory turns, losing ground, which you can see that on the index. Unilever, you know, has, you know, had the pattern that we talked about. So you've got to really take the individual company, show the pattern, and then start to group it against competitors. Here's Colgate versus Procter & Gamble. Again, you can see Colgate is a higher performer. Colgate has lost ground in the last three years. Procter & Gamble is starting to gain ground. So when we're talking about supply chain index, and when we're talking about supply chain excellence, what we're doing is we're coming back to the base definitions of what are the metrics that matter, the ones that have the highest correlation to market cap, what is market driven, the ability for a company to have a consistent pattern year over year irrespective of the economy, looking at the companies by industry, really doing the pattern recognition on the orbit charts to look at year-over-year -year improvement, then taking into the orbit chart and applying some math to be able to look at are we drawing improvement on the effective frontier of growth, our ability to drive cost, which we measure through operating margin, and the reason why we use operating margin and not EBITDA, our cost of goods, is there is far more volatility in the orbit pattern for EBITDA or cost of goods sold. On cycles, we're using inventory, not cash to cash, not working capital, because we find better progress is made when we do not focus on compound metrics or combined metrics. So cash to cash is the combination of receivables plus inventory minus payables. And if we only tie ourselves to the cash-to-cash -cash cycle, we miss the fact that we're not really driving improvement in inventory. And since inventory is so important to market capitalization and the balance sheet, we're looking at the intersection of operating margin and inventory. And then we're also looking at complexity. And the metrics that we're using in the index and the metrics that matter for complexity is return on invested capital. And that is a measure of asset utilization. And are we able, in the face of complexity, to drive asset utilization at a better rate than the market? So, you know, in our work, as we publish and we measure supply chain improvement, we determine the supply chains to admire, and we start to map the evolution of supply chain leaders on the effective frontier, we'll do this by industry. We'll do it very deliberately based upon reported metrics because self-reported things like customer service just are meaningless. And we share it openly for supply chain leaders around the world so that they can look at their progress. They can understand the progress of their peer group. They can understand the progress of which technologies and which organizational structures drive the most improvement. And it is a journey. It's a path of year-over-year -year improvement. And it really comes down to being able to drive the metrics that matter in a strategy. And the way we get unstuck is we've really got to focus cross-functionally on this balanced portfolio. Alignment of employees across the supply chain from customer's customer to supplier's supplier 
on the balanced portfolio. And then our research shows that when you balance the portfolio and you incent all employees equally on the metrics that matter, you don't have the gaps in alignment of sales and operations, and you are able to align better on the metrics that matter. And then in the functions, instead of having a functional cost like the lowest manufacturing cost, you will have a focus on total cost, and you will take the functions to be able to really focus on reliability. So as we look at reliability and the functions, it's things like forecasting and first pass yield and OEE or the effectiveness of manufacturing, on-time delivery, customer ship complete, hands-free order, schedule attainment, safety metrics, employee turnover. These are examples of functional metrics. And so as we think about the metrics that matter, what we really want to do is we want to drive both performance and improvement and really be able to deliver on this. And so look for our reports. We believe from the research and the interviews, what we believe drives top performance is continuity of leadership. So remember the Colgate performance? Colgate has had two supply chain leaders in that period of time. Remember the Kimberly-Clark performance? I can count on two hands the number of leaders I've talked to at Kimberly-Clark, and there hasn't been real clarity around which person led Source, Make, and Deliver together. The leaders have supply chain talent development focus. They're really working on continuity of supply chain leadership, and they're focused on a multi-year supply chain strategy. And they're asking themselves the question of what is supply chain excellence? It isn't just a simple statement. It really needs to be built. It is about potential. It is about the supply chain as a strategy. And there has to be clear governance for decision-making, strength and horizontal processes, things like sales and operations planning, supplier development, new product launch, integration with supply chain, corporate social responsibility, the horizontal processes, and excellence in supply chain planning and network design. To follow our work, we'll publish the reports right before our conference, which is in September 9th and 10th. And we'll celebrate with the supply chains to admire winners. And let me answer some questions. It's great to see that I got some questions. So uh, let me just uh, look at these questions. And uh, let's have a dialogue here. So oh, uh, one is uh, supply chain investments are very capital intensive. Some are, yes. Investment also includes tangible assets. Uh, do I include depreciation? Depreciation is included on return on invested capital. Uh, life cycle, uh, we look at by industry, and that's one of the reasons why we look at each of the industries. Uh, so then I have a question from a person who says they worked in a multinational company, food and beverage, last 10 years. They've done things the traditional way. They don't accept new technology. If the old way works, why should I change it? Well, you know, one of the things that I'm really trying to do is push the fact that I don't think the old way worked. You know, people say we have best practices. And I say, you know, do we have best practices if – the leaders aren't making progress, and I see more and more companies who are trying to push leadership really saying, I think I need to do things differently. I think I need to build outside-in processes. I can't just look at inside-out. So, um, you know, I, I'm starting to see people really question the status quo. I have a question from an educator who said, with thousands of smaller companies, how do I translate this information and advice and setting a new metric? Well, the uh, methodology can be used for small and big companies. That's what we wanted to use it. And so if you go to our website or you contact us, we'll send you the math behind calculating supply chain improvement and also calculating supply chain performance. We want people to use the formulas. We want people to help us to improve the formulas. We will have all this information available in our new community that we're launching the uh, 1st of September called BeatFusion.com, which will have all of the orbit charts that we've been working on by industries and the metrics. 
and also have a wiki. And so we're hoping through, you know, open source that bright professors and students can help us to drive it even further. So one question uh, that I get is looking at the top performance technologies not included, why? Well, it's hard to have an objective measurement of technology. I've tried this a couple of years. Um, one time I did some correlation on the percentage of IT spend, and that's really a bad measure uh, because people report it differently. And how do you measure technology? Uh, you know, is it the number of instances of ERP? Is it self-assessment of people against technology? We really haven't found a good way to do that objectively, but we do think that the adoption of technology is very important to unsticking the supply chain. We can't really manage it on spreadsheets and uh, you know, email, and unfortunately that's what we're doing on the value chain. Another question is, does this metric work for worldwide companies? Uh, yes, uh, because it works on the basis of ratios, irrespective of the currency, whether, so whether I'm doing euros or pesos or yen, uh, the ratios work to be able to drive the performance metrics and to be able to drive it across the supply chain. So I want to thank people. I'm hoping that you can either join us for our conference or join us for our community at BeatFusion.com and read our reports, uh, sign up for our newsletter. We'll continue to do the research. We want to help supply chain leaders everywhere improve their supply chains. Allison, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thanks, Laura. And I want to thank everyone that joined us today. Uh, just a few things to wrap up, like Laura said. As we mentioned earlier in the webinar, we're going to send out the slides and recording links to everyone that was on the webinar, so keep an eye out from that. Sometimes these go into spam. Um, so if you don't get anything from me by 3 o'clock tomorrow, please reach out to me directly to get those slides. Uh, as Laura mentioned, we encourage you to engage with us on social media by following us on Twitter. Uh, at uh, SC Insights LLC. Join our LinkedIn company page, or you can follow us on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net backslash Laura Ciceri. Uh, and for those of you that had questions about getting the metrics, please reach out to me directly. I'm at Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N dot Crawford at supplychainsights.com, and we'll make sure that we get you connected to the right information. Uh, as Laura mentioned, we're going to be announcing the winners of our supply chains to admire at a conference in Scottsdale this September. So there are still seats available. Uh, you can go to our website at www.supplychaininsightsglobalsummit.com to get more information and register for that. Uh, and one of the things that Laura did not mention, and I would be remiss if I didn't, is please reach out to us with any supply chain questions that you have, whether it's related to the index and measuring or SNLP risk management, anything that you're thinking about in supply chain, please let us know. We'd love to help you improve the performance of your operations, and we're here to help. So thanks, everyone, and have a great afternoon.